Garcia at Sea Biology Tutor. In this video, I'm going to be going through selected questions from the July 2020 paper one. As most of you who would have done the paper would have realized that many of the questions were repeated from previous years. So really, I'm going to focus on some of the selected questions which I um, unfamiliar with, which I have not seen before. So I'm not going to go through the entire paper. So let's look at the first question. Let's look at question six. I don't remember seeing that one before. So it says a farmer notices pink mealy bugs in his garden. He is advised to introduce the ladybird beetle to control the mealy bugs. The type of relationship between the mealy bug and the ladybird beetle is described as so this would have to be an example of predator prey relationship so that would be b so really and truly the predator would be the ladybird beetle because that is going to be feeding on the mealy bug so that's the whole purpose why the farmer introduces the ladybird beetle to control the mealy bugs so the ladybird ladybird beetle is going to be feeding on the mealy bug so that's a predator prey relationship. So that's what you call biological control. So they utilize the predator prey relationship to get rid of pests that can be harmful to plants. All right, let's look at the next question, which I thought was unfamiliar. I don't remember seeing this one before. Item seven refers to the following food chain. So we have phytoplankton, being eaten by krill, being eaten by herring, and that is being eaten by the bass. So the organisms which receive the most and least energy respectively in this food chain are the, so the organism that's going to receive the most energy has to be the phytoplankton. The phytoplankton is behaving as a producer, it's a producer. So it's going to receive energy directly from the sun. So it has to be the one that will receive the most energy. And then the least amount of energy would have to be received by the bass, which is at the end of the food chain. So the bass is, the, is at the fourth trophic level. So remember, there's a loss of energy at successive trophic levels. So you would expect the bass to have the least amount of energy. So therefore, the correct answer would be B. Alright, so we're going through, as you can notice, all of these are familiar questions. And some of the paper that I received is not very clear at all, it's not very visible, the words and the diagrams, so I'm skipping through that. And all of these would have come before. So all of these are familiar questions that I would have noticed from past papers. Um, so let's stop here at number 20 and then we're going to go on to number 23. So if number 20, autotrophic organisms derive their nutrition from. So I've seen a question similar to this but not quite worded like this. So autotrophic organisms are plants and they derive their nutrition from carbon dioxide, water, sunlight, obviously minerals like nitrates and sulfates. So all of those are examples of simple inorganic substances. So this would have to be C. So organic substances usually would contain carbon, usually bonded to hydrogen, so we're having hydrogen as well. So carbohydrates, for instance, glucose is an organic, is an organic molecule, it contains carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. So you can't necessarily say carbon dioxide is an organic substance, is an inorganic substance. So it's a gas. So it's only when the carbon usually comes with um, hydrogen that it will be considered um, an organic substance. So proteins, carbohydrates, fats, those are examples of organic substances. So vitamins as well. But when it comes to the carbon dioxide, water, um, sunlight, the minerals, those are all examples of inorganic substances. So the answer would have to be C. So the 
Photosynthesis process uses the simple inorganic substances to produce organic substances. So the organic substances, as I mentioned, that would be the glucose, the glucose, which is a carbohydrate. So the nutrition actually is derived from the simple inorganic substances. All right, let's look at number 23. So item 23 refers to the following equation which shows the oxidation of glucose in cells. So we have the aerobic respiration equation shown here. So we have glucose, C6H12O6, plus oxygen gives you carbon dioxide and water. And typically this should be balanced, a balanced equation. You have a sits in front of the oxygen, in, the car, in front of the carbon dioxide and then in front of the water but they're, they're not showing the balanced equation here but anyways um, they're showing you now that re, there's a release of energy from this reaction so this oxidation of glucose that is a respiration um, process that is happening aerobic respiration so the question says the energy released from the process above is so when that energy is released from the process of respiration what is done with it what how is it used so usually that energy would be now this is a tricky tricky question in terms of the options that they gave because I can see B being an option converted to ATP so that energy is used to build ATP which is the energy storage molecule so adenosine triphosphate but if you go down to look at the next the next few options so we know it can't be stored in a high energy bond in ADP. So we rule that one out. But the one with stored in a high energy bond in ATP, that one looks more specific as to how the energy released from the process above is actually stored. So remember ATP is the general overall storage molecule for energy, but the energy is actually stored within the bond in the ATP molecule, that high energy bond. So let me refer to a diagram so you understand. So in this diagram, you're seeing how ATP is formed. So basically the energy from respiration, the respiration process is actually used to create this bond um, between a phosphate molecule in ADP with an inorganic phosphate, a loose inorganic phosphate. So what happens is that the energy from respiration is actually creating the ATP and it's going to be stored in the energy rich bond that is formed. So this bond here in the red line represents the high energy bond. So that is more specific. So yes, it is converted into ATP, which is a storage molecule, but the energy is actually used to form the, the high energy bond between the two phosphates here in ATP. So that's just a little explanation so you understand it a little better. So based on that, and I could understand why some people may think B could be the correct answer. And it's quite, it's not incorrect to be honest, but if I had to choose, I would choose D, store it in the high energy bond in ATP. All right, so we finish with 23. Let's scroll down. This one is a blur, so I can't even look at those questions and attempt to answer them. Um, so skipping that. All right, let's look at item 31. So item 31 refers to the following diagram of a potato plant. Which part of the plant contains the most starch? So we have one pointing at the leaf, two is pointing at the stem, three is pointing at the actual potato, so that's the food storage organ, and then four would be the, the roots. So this would have to be three, the actual potato is storing the starch. So C. All right, let's move on to the next question I wanna look at. All right, let's look at 34. So the correct order for an effective nervous response is, so we're pretty much looking at the nervous pathway in which impulses would travel. 
So if you look at these options, you can clearly eliminate the ones that are wrong. So for instance, option A ends with receptor. That makes no sense. The receptor usually starts the nervous pathway because that is what's receiving the stimulus. So we can rule that out. Um, similarly here for B, we can't start with the spinal cord and then the brain, then the receptor, then to the effector. That doesn't quite make sense either. And then for C, we're starting off with the effector. So the effector should be the last part of the nervous pathway. The effector is actually going to be carrying out the response. So there's no way that that can be first. So that leads us to D, receptor being first, then the messages pass to the spinal cord, then the brain, and then finally the effector which carries out the response. So D would be the correct answer for number 34. All right, moving along. So we see some more familiar questions there. All right, let's look at item 37. So item 37 refers to the following diagram of a reflex arc. So we're still on this whole nervous pathway concept. So which label structure replaces the relays the impulse to an effector? So which label structure relays the impulse to an effector? So we have to figure out what the labels are. So if we're looking at A, A has to be pointing at the, the receptor. But then we see the receptor connected. So D would have to represent the sensory neuron. So as you can, if you follow the arrows, you can see the direction of the nervous impulse in which it's traveling. So we're going from A to D, which is the sensory neuron. And then we're going to have, we're going into the spinal cord because this is a cross section of the spinal cord we're actually looking at here. And B is pointing at the relay neuron. And then the relay neuron is connected to C, which will be the motor neuron. And that motor neuron sends the impulses to the effector, so this looks like an actual muscle. The muscle would either contract or relax. So you carry out the muscle would carry out the response. So it's acting as an effector. So therefore, the correct answer for this, so which is sending the impulse to an effector, it would have to be C. So they use that word relay, and I hopefully that would not have um, confused students because they might be thinking the relay neuron which would actually be B, but what is actually sending the impulse to the effector would have to be C, which would be the motor neuron. All right, so that is number 37. All right, let's look at number 38. So item 38 refers to the following diagrams which show movement in plants and animals as seen in a bird and a vine. So we have some birds and then we have a vine shown here. So which of the following statements about movement in a bird and movement in a vine is true? So this is one you have to really read through carefully and think it through. So it says both the bird and the vine move parts of their body. And the reality is that is true. So the birds are moving their wings to fly and they're also moving their whole body to actually move from one position to another. So the wings of the bird are parts of the bird and with the vine, so typically vine, so vine is a plant-like structure and it is going to move by growth. So growth movement as it gets longer, you're going to see movement shown and then also part movement. So it actually looks like the vine is growing on another plant. So that's how vines usually grow. So they may be growing on another plant or some other structure. So they're often referred to as like climbing plants. So as they're growing, they're extending in length and kind of taking over the area. Um, so let's see what B, stand, what B says. The bird and the vine move because of a stimulus. So that isn't quite true. The bird can just choose to move 
on its own. It doesn't necessarily have to be initiated by a stimulus. Um, C, the bird moves its entire body while the plant does not move. So that one has to be ruled out for sure as well. So yes, the bird is moving its entire body as it's flying, but the plant is moving. Plants move in some form or fashion. They don't move their whole body, but they move. So we rule out C. And then the entire body of the bird moves while a part of the plant moves. So for this one, I can see some some confusion as to which one would make the most sense in terms of between A and D. So the reality is both the bird and the vine they're moving parts of their body and then for D we can see that the entire body of the bird is moving while a part of the plant moves. So I am going to go with, with D. The entire body of the bird is moving and then part of the plant is moving as it is growing. So D. Alright, let's move on to the next question. The next unfamiliar question is 40. So which of the following factors does not contribute to glaucoma in the eye? So first of all, you need to understand what glaucoma is. So glaucoma generally is caused by uh, an increase in the pressure of the fluids in the eye that can lead to damage of the optic nerve. So when the optic nerve is damaged, that is going to affect the, the flow of impulses to the brain. So out of all of these, and I can see this question being very tricky. Um, first option here, vitamin A deficiency. So usually when you think of a vitamin A deficiency, you think mostly of night blindness because the vitamin A is really necessary for, for helping build up the pigments in the retina. So the retina has the light sensitive cells that would allow you to see, to see um, in the, um, color and to see in the dark and so forth. So vitamin A deficiency usually affects the retina of the eye and it can also affect um, other parts of the eye such as the cornea. So it can lead to like thickness in the cornea. So that, that doesn't have anything to do with the glaucoma, but it may still be responsible in some form um, for causing glaucoma if you really do a lot of research possibly. Um, with heredity, so this meaning does it have a genetic component? So I would have to say heredity would be a contributing factor. So like if glaucoma runs in the family, there's a higher risk of you developing glaucoma. So I think heredity would be a factor. Um, stroke, so that affects the brain. And we know that the brain controls the eye. So if you have a stroke, so usually caused by a blockage of a blood vessel leading to a particular part of the brain, it could have some kind of effect on the eye. So persons who have suffered a stroke may end up with vision problems. So glaucoma is a, an example of a vision problem. And then age, as you get older, glaucoma is a condition that tends to develop, that could develop as you get older. So out of these options, I think I'm going to go with the vitamin A not being an actual contributing factor. So if it was night blindness, then yes, that would be a factor, but I'll lean more to the vitamin A deficiency. All right, let's look at the next few questions. So all of these I've seen before, so I'm just scrolling through. Alright, let's look at this one, item 51. So this one is a little blurry, but we you can still manage to see, make out what what is um, what the words are. So it says item 51 refers to the following diagrams which show the stages of mitosis. So we have four stages highlighted here. So they ask you to pretty much order the stages in the correct sequence. So the correct order of these stages is, 
So let's look at the four stages we have here. So the first stage has to be three. So we have the one cell and you see the two chromosomes shown here. So at this stage here, this would have to be prophase. So before replication has occurred. So this would be the first stage. And then after replication occurs, after the chromosomes make a copy of themselves, then they usually would line up at the equator of the cell or the middle of the cell. So that would be two. So you're seeing they're lining up. Now existing as double strands with sister chromatids. So they're double strands here connected by a centromere. So they're lining up here at metaphase. So after metaphase, then you're going to have the sister chromatids pulling apart from each other. They're separating. So that has to be stage one. So they're moving away to opposite ends of the cell. So then at the end of mitosis, you're going to have the two cells produce with the two chromosomes shown here. So that has to be three first, then two, then one, and then four. So that would be C. So three, two, one, and then four. All right, let's go over here to 54. It's not very clear at all, but I wanted to do it. I can make out the words um, that you can be able to read. So it says here, albinism is caused by a recessive allele. Two normal parents produce an albino child. This is because so it's testing your knowledge of genetics. So if you have two normal parents and they produce an albino child, each of the parents have to be heterozygous, meaning that they are gonna carry one dominant allele and one recessive allele. So for instance, both parents should be A, A. So big A, little A. Big A, little A. So they're heterozygous in order to to um, have a child that is an albino, that albino would have to inherit two recessive alleles, so one from each parent. So the albino child would therefore be two recessive alleles, so that is the albino. So that is how we get two normal parents, so their skin would be normal, but they're heterozygous, they're carrying the recessive allele. So both parents were heterozygous for the gene. So that would have to be B. So it's difficult to make out the other options, but I'm seeing one parent was homozygous dominant for the other and the other, for the trait and the other heterozygous. And then the other one, one parent was homozygous dominant for the trait and the other homozygous recesses. So that for sure is wrong. So B should be the answer for that. Right, scrolling past these because these are all familiar. Oh, we're going to stop here at 56 because this is one I haven't seen before and I already have the working. So it says two goats heterozygous for fast growth rate are crossed. What percentage of the entire F1 population would be expected to possess homozygous alleles? So you need to set up a little punit square to work out the F1 population. So if the goats are heterozygous for fast growth, they have to each contain one dominant allele and one recessive allele. So I'm using the letter G to represent the gene. So we have both of them being heterozygous. So I set up the punit square here. So then you just perform the cross. So the results of the F1 population, the offspring, you have one that is homozygous dominant then the next two children, the next two offspring, sorry, the kids would be heterozygous. And then the last kid would be homozygous recessive. So the question asks, what percentage of the entire F1 population would be expected to possess homozygous alleles? So therefore we have two of the offspring with homozygous alleles. So we have homozygous dominant and then we have homozygous recessive. So that means that is 50% of the population. 
2 out of 4, so that's 50%, so therefore the answer would have to be C. Alright, so there's one more question I wanted to do, 57, so a little blurry again, but it says a man with blood group A married a woman with blood group B. They produce two children with blood group AB. The alleles A and B are described as being, so this is a pretty simple one, but I don't remember ever seeing a question like this. Um, so the answer for this would be co-dominant B. So they kind of exist together, neither one is dominant over the other. So we pretty much come to the end of this paper. So all of these are questions that we would have done um, before in past papers. So that is the end of the July 2020 paper one. If you found this video helpful, feel free to subscribe, like and share. And don't forget to hit that notification bell.